As Christians, everything we do will eventually fall under public scrutiny. And while our activities and behaviors as Christians should be done primarily to honor our Lord, nevertheless, the world is watching. And that means that the way that we live should be a witness to others. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. As believers, we should expect to be challenged by some things. We should expect that we are going to need to utilize the word of God to shape our lives to look differently than the world looks. In fact, even as believers, we're constantly throughout, especially the New Testament, referred to as sheep. We need shepherds. and Jesus is the great, good, ultimate shepherd. And as sheep, we are prone to wander. It's very likely then that there will be particular caverns and crevices and little cliff sides that we may be particularly prone to wander into. As the people of God, there should be some things that we should be known for. And we should be known for turning back from those things that are most common for us as people. Last week, we looked at Acts chapter 17 and observed how Paul, the apostle, dealt with the men of Athens during his street sermon On Mars Hill. And then I highlighted three specific things we noticed in Paul's sermon there. Three corrections, perhaps, to wrong thinking. Even wrong thinking that could invade the mind of a Christian. And here they are. The first I said was a high view of God. This was an ever-present reality in the way that Paul spoke about God. We cannot think too highly of God. And this is where we as Christians must start. It should be the first charge leveled against us as believers. They think their God is bigger and better than everything else. And they organize everything in their lives around whatever they think he wants. Guilty. First and foremost, we should resist a low view of God and continually pursue a high view of God. Second, in that sermon I highlighted a bold approach to evangelism. Now, this is almost impossible to read the accounts of the apostles in their interaction with people and not see this all over the place, a boldness in their evangelism, just a kind of a fearless courage in the face of all types of adversity. They didn't care what people thought. They just wanted to share the gospel in honor of their Lord and for the love of lost people. We, likewise, must pursue a bold approach to evangelism. We must grow in our gospel witness, in our desire to press back against the inner comforts we so often want. Even though bold Christianity today is very unfamiliar to many American Christians, a true and living gospel demands boldness and urgency. The third thing I highlighted from that sermon was a tenacious resolve to please God rather than men. We must be willing to follow God's word even into a life that will make other people feel uncomfortable. Not because it makes them uncomfortable, but because we want to please God even if it doesn't please men. The church is a haven for refugees. Every non-believer who is a refugee from the world's ways, is welcome. But the worldly reformer is not welcome. We say this on occasion. Anyone is welcome to come here. If you're trying to learn about the truth of God, you want to know what it is the Bible teaches about him, you are welcome to come and to be changed by God's word. But you may not try to change God's word. The reason that I think this needs to be in our list is twofold. First, this is without a doubt a prominent feature of the ministry that we read about in the New Testament. If you were to read about how the men and women in the New Testament responded to the world and the culture around them, and then observe the way that so many American Christians today respond to the world and culture around us, you'd have to conclude that something doesn't add up. Second, because of mission drift. 
Mission drift is an ever-present enemy for Christians in this age. We must set our minds and our hearts to not let that happen to us and to our children, to slowly be shaped by the world rather than be shapers of the world. You've heard about what happens to the frog in the kettle, haven't you? If you drop a frog into a kettle of boiling water, he'll jump right out to save his life. But if you put a frog in a kettle of tepid water and slowly turn up the heat, he'll cook until he's dead. We must be absolutely resolved to not let that happen to us. And so we must be looking for the areas, the places where we have been shaped by the desire to please mankind rather than God. Now, I believe that it would bring glory to God, that it would serve to strengthen our fellow believers, and that it would greatly aid in us reaching the lost for us to live in such a way that we would be known for these values. Last week, we went into the New Testament to look at these three. Today, we're going to look back into the Old Testament in order to add four more to the list. Four more areas where I think that we are prone, even as Christians, to wander. Four more areas that we need to be especially resolved to pursue in this day. Now, the principles I'll be drawing on from the passage we're going to cover just like last week, can be found all over the Bible, but I particularly chose this passage because I think that they are especially highlighted here. And as last week, I'm going to go very quickly through the text, just a very short uh, kind of commentary on the passage itself because I don't want you to to get lost in the nitty-gritty on this particular sermon, but to look at the whole passage in its entirety, the way that it would have been delivered to the people who first heard it. Get a greater sense of what's being said in a big picture reality. The passage we're going to read through today is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 14. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to read through it and then pray. Then we're going to go back and, like I said before, quite briefly look at those passages with a brief commentary and then seek to apply. Let's read. Chapter 4, starting in verse 5. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. Let's pray. Father, as we seek to be guided by your word, as we seek to look even at this Old Testament passage written to people thousands of years ago, Father, I pray that you would help us understand what is expected of us principally because of this. Help us to apply it rightly now. And Lord, in your good mercy, please help us to embody the things that we learn here for your glory and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Going back to the beginning of that passage again. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse five. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. This is just the setup verse to the passage. This is when the Old Testament people of God, the Israelites, were preparing to enter into the promised land 
after having wandered in the desert for 40 years. God speaks to the people through Moses, and this is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, where he summarizes the history of Israel's desert wanderings and then restates the law of God for the new generation who will cross over the Jordan and take possession of the land. So here we have Moses basically saying, I've already taught you this, but now I'm reminding you so that you will remain faithful when you enter into the promised land. And this is the crux of the message regarding those statutes. Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Moses says here that the law of God, as being observed and practiced by his people, will cause others to take notice. And what will be their response? Awe. I often hear people today point to the Old Testament. They point to the law and they scoff. They mock these statutes as unjust or archaic or even nonsensical. And this way of thinking has unfortunately invaded the thinking of many believers in our day. But any derision aimed at the law of God is in the final analysis not an indictment on the law of God, but on the scoffer who demonstrates by his contempt just how ignorant he is of true righteousness and justice and of the holiness of God. In other words, God did not expect the people are going to think these laws are crazy. But the people will hear the laws and say, these are righteous laws. What God must be theirs to give them laws so just, statues so righteous. The Old Testament law is the most equitable and just system of governance that has ever been devised in the history of the world. Any flaws that can be found in that law are a result either of the sinfulness of man or in the necessary accommodations it makes for the imperfections of the world. Christians, we would do well to have a much higher view of God's law than we do. Unfortunately, I think even some believers today think less of the law of God than the Assyrians did in the Old Testament. That's a problem. When we observe people see the law of God and hold it in derision, that should be a clear and evident sign to us of just how far we have fallen from God's standard of righteousness. There's a reason these rules, these laws seem foreign to us because in our day, to put it simply, we're crazy. But God's law is true. Continues on. Only take care and keep your soul diligently lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. A couple weeks ago, I taught on the fear of the Lord. And how important it was even to teach our children that they should fear the Lord. This is exactly what this says. Remember that day. Think back to that day so that you can fear the Lord and teach your children to do the same. Notice the concern that Moses has that the people might forget what they've experienced. Take care. Keep your soul diligently. Because they forget the miracles they've observed. They forget the discipline that they've received from the Lord and the laws that they have been given, why the miracles were there, what they were to teach the people. We as people are so prone to forget even the most significant and important lessons of our lives. We must be diligent to remember what God has done in our lives and what he has taught us. And not only for our own benefit, but also for the sake of our children and our children's children. That's why he says, make them known to your children. Don't remember them only for your own sake, but that they would be passed on. I want you to consider the New Testament, the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Come, 
lived perfectly, did miracles, taught, died, raised again to new life, ascended into heaven. Were you there for that? Did you see that take place? No. Then how, did you, how, how do you know about it? Because someone told you. Or someone wrote it down or recorded it for you or in some format delivered that to you. You received it through others. Just last night during our family worship time, Gabe, my son, asked me, he's seven, he said, why doesn't Jesus just return every generation and show people himself again? Like, why doesn't he just reveal himself every generation? Just keep coming back. And I told him, did you know, Jesus even said to his disciples that after I die and raise, I will go away and it will be better for you if I leave. Because if I go, I will send you the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness, to teach the world of truth, to recall to your minds what I've taught you, to inspire the writing of Holy Scripture. Because the plan has always been not just for Jesus to return generation after generation, but for a delivered word to be given and to go out from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. That has always been the plan just as it was in the Old Testament. God did not intend to return back to every generation as a burning bush again, or as an angelic messenger, or as a pillar of fire. The plan was for people to tell their children and multiply the witness by one person telling the next. That has always been the plan. Continues on. And you came near... And stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Now, we've covered this event uh, much more detailed uh, just several weeks ago. We were in the book of Hebrews. When I revisited back to what that time looked like, that, that the people stood before the mountain They heard the voice of God and received his law. This is how it went down. And and what continues here, we've covered in even more detail, but look what he says. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the 10 commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me, Moses, at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you are going over to possess. So again, if you weren't here for just a few weeks ago when we covered that in our walking through Hebrews, the people were present around the mountain. They heard the Ten Commandments. They heard the voice of God. And they were so afraid, so impacted by that intensity that they they cried out and said, no, stop speaking to us. Speak to Moses instead and he'll talk to us because we can't bear it. And so Moses became the mediator, the representative who stood between God and his people in that day. He heard the rest of the laws and the commands, and he brought them to the people. This is a very familiar kind of passage. This brings us to the end of that section we're going to cover today. And if if you're having familiarity here, it's because it's revisited in the New Testament multiple places, like in Hebrews. This is already a revisiting of what took place back in Exodus 20 and 21. And it's repeated multiple times. It's a very familiar thing for us if if you know the Old Testament at all. God reminds the people through a prophet of the miracles he performed among them, of the laws and statutes that they had been given, and of their responsibilities as the people of God. He knew they were going to go into the world, and they were going to be surrounded by others who were not like them. And they needed to not be shaped by that world, but to hold fast to what he's commanded. That's the whole point. We try to build bridges sometimes of this old covenant people prior to Jesus. And how are we supposed to look at some of these things today? We see so many things that we can be served by. You and I are a people surrounded by others in a world that would like to import their views onto us. But just like even the Old Testament people and the New Testament believers being reminded in a similar way, we are not to be of the world even when we're in the world. And there are areas that we may have more likelihood to err. And that's where that list comes back into play. So what do we see in this kind of passage that we should be challenged by, encouraged by as Christians? I hope that there are genuine challenges, things that actually make us feel slightly uncomfortable, that press against our conscience because that's what the Word of God is supposed to do for us. 
So let's go back to that list, those three that I started with at the beginning here, we covered last week. I'm gonna add to that list four more values, four more principles that should be endemic in the Christian life today. First, an uncompromising commitment to God's word. An uncompromising commitment to God's word. Did you notice that when Moses gets to the end of his life in ministry, he's like 120 when he gets to, to the end of Deuteronomy. Did you know that? He was about 40 when he headed away from the people of God and ran out to run to Midian. He was a shepherd there for 40 years. He comes back when he's 80 to lead the people out, wanders for 40 more years. He's about 120 years old. And at the very end of this guy's life, old dude, he does not update the law for a new generation. He doesn't give them the Ten Commandments 2.0. Let's summarize it to three but he delivers the exact word of God as it was intended. He sticks to what God had commanded. Look again at Deuteronomy, that same passage. Look back at verses uh, verses five and six. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land you were entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. This wasn't just for a time. This wasn't just like, oh, good, so you did this for a little while? Great, now, chain's gone, do whatever you want. No, he stuck true to the word of God. As a people, as a church, we must be completely loyal, utterly committed to God's word. We are to be people of the book. Everything that we do must be directed and shaped by this book. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. A familiar verse, I hope, but one that is worth regularly repeating. And when we talk about obeying God's word, submitting to God's word, not compromising on God's word, we mean the whole thing. We really do. It's one of the reasons I was desirous to look into the Old Testament to get help for the kinds of principles we're looking at today. Because we don't want to neglect the passages that we feel less familiar with. We don't want to throw certain parts under the bus. And this kind of thinking, this kind of commitment is dangerous to the world. That we are more committed to this book than to their new ideas is very frustrating to them. We will not follow the world into that folly. We refuse to progress into that debauchery because there is no progress in that pursuit, but rather a regression into chaos resulting in judgment. And that to the world is fanaticism and extremism. Whatever we are to do, we must find it in here. Our dedication to God's word must be without equal. This means that we're going to preach from the word. We're going to pray from the word. We're going to gather in our groups together and study it. We're going to align everything to what it says. And when we find an area in our lives that's not aligning to what's clearly said here, we need to change because the word of God is true. I want you to think about that. I ask this question to my kids quite often. This is one of our catechism questions. I wrote up a little group of questions that I ask my kids every night. One of the questions that I regularly ask them is I say, what should a person do if he does not agree with God? And the kids reply. I ask the question and they recite back. They say, repent because God is always right. Amen. That's the answer. There's only one right response when we find ourselves out of accord of the word. We change rather than demanding that the word of God does. The next point is closely related to this uncompromising commitment to the word of God. The fact that we refuse to budge one inch. It's very closely related, but it must be stated as distinct. And it's this, a conviction that doctrine matters. Doctrine. Just a word we should all get really familiar with. It's just just doc. It comes from the same root word as doctor. It just means teaching. It's a good, hearty word. Our teaching matters. What you believe really does matter. And the reason I think this needs to be stated as distinct from the one above is because I've met many Christians in my life that are quick to affirm the previous statement. Of course, we shouldn't compromise on God's word. But they are also quick to admit 
that they believe there are many areas of doctrine and even full passages, maybe books in the Bible that are not deserving of our energy. But we must take that to heart. Listen, all truth matters. All of it. Not just the ones we feel the most familiar or comfortable with. All of it. Look at, the, look at what the passage said here. Deuteronomy 4, uh, 9. Look, look at this again. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Why is Moses so committed to telling these people, don't forget, don't let anything go, draw back to memory? Why? Because if they miss something, one significant something, that could make a dramatic change. What if they remembered all the events of the Exodus except... The fact that they put the blood over the doorposts. What about just that one thing? Would that be significant? Yeah, you better believe it would. What you believe matters. We are so, as, just as, as humans, just humans, we're prone to forget even the things that we've observed and learned, even to neglect more so what we've not yet internalized, what we've not yet studied. But we must take these things and see them as critical if they're in the Word of God. This does not mean, of course, that you need to be a scholar in order to gain full benefit from God's Word. Not at all. This does not mean that every Christian should be a professor of theology. That's not the point here at all. But it does mean that we should care about all the truths that are found in God's Word. You know, I've known Christians all my life who say, man, I love the Bible, I just won't read the book of Revelation. I love the Bible, but man, those, those Old Testament prophets, woo! I don't know if I want to spend any more time there. Have you heard that kind of thing before? What an error that is. I've even heard pastors, pastors, shepherd teachers, say things like, well, my congregation doesn't need to know that part of the Bible, that category of doctrine. Brothers and sisters, that is an egregiously costly error. Of course it is true that there are doctrinal categories that are essential and should be more emphasized and more regularly visited than others. Of course, we should find that that is true. Additionally, we ought not hold an unrealistic standard for what other Christians and other churches believe and demand that they agree with our view on every word of the Bible or be canceled as heretics. Of course, we ought not be like that. We should be quick to extend gracious generosity and patience with other believers. We should be slow to judge, and we should not imagine uniformity in this age in order for there to be peace. I fully expect that there's error in what we think, in what I think, in what I believe. There's no way I'm the only human in the history of the world to have gotten all those things right. But there is no category of doctrine, no Bible passage, no practical or theological question that we may avoid, none. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, in the famous Great Commission passage. This is the big go into all the world passage. Beautiful, wonderful passage. But listen to what Jesus says in this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Not just try to hit the bullet points, guys. Just that one sermon I preached. Just the stuff you remember best. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Every word that was commanded by the Lord is to be preached. Paul conveyed a similar sentiment during his farewell address to the Ephesian elders. He's getting together with this church body who he'd spent time with over the course of many months. He loved them deeply. And as he's being sent out, maybe to never see them again, he says this to them. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Later in that same passage in Acts 20, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent to the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What you believe will impact not only your eternity, and the whole of your life, but all the minutes that make up your life. There's no category of living that is not sufficiently addressed in God's word. No part of our lives, no part of our thinking where we should say, I don't care what God says about that. 
none. We must maintain this conviction that what a person believes truly matters. Doctrine matters. We must preserve the truth for future generations. But this, of course, is not to say that our faith should be all head and no heart. Not at all. In fact, that's why this is the very next value, a ferocious love for others. Now, this is one that we're going to see just just implicit in this particular text. There's there's some that are way more intense about this. This is implicit. Follow follow me here. The New Testament's going to pick up on the little implication on this kind of thoughtfulness for the others outside of even the people of God. And the New Testament's going to blow this wide open. But look even what it says right here in this Old Testament passage. In a time when God is mostly devoted to and aiming his directed love at the people, the Israelites. Look what it says here. Keep them, the statutes, and do them. Why? For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Think about that. The Israelites, obedience to the law of God was to be a sign to the nations. It was to benefit non-Israelites. Even when God was working specifically with these Jewish people, he had his eye and heart on others. The Old Testament is filled with missionary work. We don't see this as much as we see it in the New Testament because it's so emphasized there. But all we need to do is look back at characters like Jonah where God refused to let him not go and share the good news to the people of Nineveh. Like the kings Nebuchadnezzar and Xerxes who in their own due time acknowledged that God is the one and only true God where a pharaoh would eventually do this. The people of Egypt would see what happened by this great and mighty God and know that he alone is true. Where Solomon and his teaching would draw people from the corners of the earth to come and see the might and the glory of this God. In the New Testament, Jesus even indicts the Pharisees by telling them, you send missionaries all over the world. And you make the converts over there twice sons of hell as yourselves. So he's indicting them for not teaching rightly. But that's what they were doing. Moses went out into all the world and all over. In synagogues. Even in the Roman world, by the time that we see the New Testament written, there are already Jews all over the place proclaiming the one true Yahweh God to the people that are there. This is why we have God-fearing Greeks. Why? Because the Jews went out there and witnessed. This is why the Magi even knew to come from the Far East to Jesus when he was born because they knew there was going to be a king of Israel born. Our motivation must never be our own comfort. We're not the ones who live on an island, not the cruise ship Christians. Let's just make our way and pretend everything else is okay. People can be drowning in the sea around us, but we're just having a good old time while the world goes goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, we're, we're not those bomb shelter Christians who say, who cares what's going on out there? Let's just hunker down until Jesus returns. That's never been our charge. And we are to be motivated by love for God and for others more than self. The New Testament, as I said, will take these kind of implications that he has a view of the world, that others will see this, that, that God cares about the other nations knowing this about him. And the New Testament will blow this up to full size. Jesus says in Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is even the second greatest commandment, isn't it? The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love God first, others second, self last. So, of course, we begin with a high view of God. He is worthy of all of our love, adoration, affection, and attention. But we are to have a ferocious love, a real love for others. This is so critical to include here. I think it needs to be included right here because the kind of aggressive and intense language, the the highly charged speech that I've been using here can easily, in our day, I know, be labeled as unloving. You know that, right? Right? Nothing could be further from the truth. We are commanded by God 
and given the perfect example in our Lord Jesus to have real compassion on people, real love for their souls, for their needs, not fake earthly version of love where people might just want us to convey. We must let God define what real love is. If you love your neighbor, then you must be concerned for his or her soul. You can't genuinely love your neighbor and not care about that. A ferocious love for others means that we will want to take advantage of every penny of relational capital and spend that in our lives for the sake of gospel witness. Well, I've heard people object to this before. Oh, Rich, what you're saying, you want, you want to like leverage the relationships in your life for gospel witness? Like, like When you look at somebody, you think non-Christian, go out there and get the, yeah. Yeah, I do. The objection is often, doesn't that just make a person a target? Don't they just become a project to you? I want you to imagine a billionaire moves into your neighborhood. He starts making friends with all of your neighbors. And then word spreads that he came to your neighborhood for the expressed purpose of giving his money away to the people that he meets to the tune of $10 million per family. He invites you over to his house for dinner. And sure enough, as the evening wraps up, he leans forward, hands you an envelope, and says, here's a check for $10 million. What is your response? So, all I am to you is a target for your generosity? You could respond that way. But who would be the the fool in that story then? The benevolent billionaire? Or you, who refused the gift? And we have something infinitely more valuable to offer than money. Do you want to know how you make people not a target when you share the gospel? Love them ferociously. If you actually love people and are not looking for a notch on your belt, whoo, did my evangelistic thing this week. If you actually love and care about people, it doesn't matter if someone would say that they're a target for you. You're darn right you're a target because I love you. I don't want you to die and go to hell. If you don't believe the gospel for salvation, you need to know as a non-believer today, that God will hold you accountable for your sins. And when you die, you will be separated from him for forever because your sins deserve eternal punishment in hell. And only those who see this and love you and care about you want to warn you from that and tell you, not on your own merit, but because Jesus died, lived perfect, and yet died like a sinner, and he took death where you should have had it, you believe in him and can trade Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That he died for sins and was raised from the dead, defeating death. We want everybody to know this. If you're not a believer today, you need to talk to someone next to you. A believer who loves you, who will not play with kid gloves, but will tell you right to your face, listen, yes, if you don't embrace this, you will die and go to hell. And I love you enough to tell you that. That's real love. It's not the fake love that just wants you to like me. Because I care more about you than what you think about me. That kind of love is so intense that oftentimes we feel uncomfortable by it. You care enough about me to confront me? You care enough about me that you're willing to risk my approval of you? Yeah, real love. A ferocious love for others is a value worthy of pursuing. If you struggle with loving lost people in your life as a believer, you need to pray that God would give you that love. And I'm betting he will. I, I love telling people the story of how Laura and I came to Utah. We have no business being here. No family here. We knew zero ministry contacts before we came on out here. We have no reference point for Mormonism prior to moving out to Utah. We have no business for it. And people ask, well, then why'd you move to Utah? I don't know. Because God took my heart, cracked it open, took love for Mormons, stuffed it in, and closed it shut. I just love them. I, I don't know why. Sometimes they drive me crazy. But I love them. I want to be around Mormon people. I want to share the gospel with those people and spend my life and energy on that. And I am not alone. This is the coolest thing. I've shared this story before, but I'll never forget when I first moved to Salt Lake City, I went to a gathering of ministry leaders right downtown. And uh, there were maybe like 20 of us in the room. And each man and woman present there stood up at one point or another and shared their heart for reaching a unique niche for ministry. You see, if you were to look at the global pie of human peoples, Mormonism would be this tiny sliver. We're already a super tiny niche for all these giant religions that are out there in the world that that Christians are going after, trying to help the people there. But when you zoom into that little tiny sliver, it's amazing to me 
to find how people have been given love from God for specific individuals. I distinctly remember one man standing up and he told us that in the early 2000s, like 2005 to 2008, like in that amount of time, about 100 Somalian refugees uh, came from Somalia and moved to Salt Lake City uh, as refugees. And they don't all know Jesus. And this guy loses sleep every night because he's been called by God to reach those 100 people in the history of the world. Do you understand how infinitesimally small that is? How tiny that slice of the pie would have to be? What small a percentage of humanity that's ever existed? And this man, this Christian brother, breaks for that group. Oh, man. For every people group that exists who has not heard the gospel, you can be rest assured that somewhere in the world there's a Christian in whom God has put the restless, irrepressible love for that people and an aching desire to reach them with the gospel. I'm telling you. It's awesome. A ferocious love for others should be nurtured in our church. Last on our list for today is a really hard point to miss in passages that state them as clearly as the one we covered today. And that's this. Bottom line, a prioritizing of the home. A prioritizing of the home. I want you to think about this with me. I want you to consider the Bible view on the centrality of the home. The God-expected focus on family discipleship and training. God demands an intentional plan for generational impact. In other words, God doesn't converse with us as parents. I'm talking to parents for a moment. God doesn't converse with parents and say, hey, so uh, what are we going to do about your kids? What are we hoping together happens? With them? Maybe someday a missionary will talk to them. You get, I'm being silly for a moment, but you understand what I'm getting at. Look, look at what it said back in this passage. Check this out. Because I, I, I believe you'll see this here with me. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Already says it once right here. All those things you remembered, you make sure you pass those on. You do not store those up for yourself. They, those memories do not belong to you. They are gifts to your children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. A couple weeks ago, I taught on the uh, fear of the Lord. And I said, we need to teach our kids to fear the Lord. That's exactly what this said right here, didn't it? Not only you fear the Lord, but then teach them so as well. Teach them to fear the Lord too. One of the most undervalued yet fundamental biblical demands is the discipleship and evangelism of our children, of the next generation of Christians. The primary training ground for our battle in this world is in the home. As Christians, your highest evangelism and discipleship priorities are the people who live under your roof. They're the first and foremost. You don't scramble over those souls right there to get out into the world to do that. This, this was super huge for me just a few years ago to really realize this. Because as a brother in Christ and as a pastor, I wanted to get out and just disciple all these other people. And I realized that I was beginning to neglect my family, the closest disciples. And God had to, had to strike my heart and make it clear to me that however many disciples that might be out there that need discipleship and evangelism growing, all that kind of good stuff that we're commanded in the word, the most important disciples that I will ever know are my wife and our six children. The Great Commission begins there. Every day you wake up and go to sleep in the most critical mission field of your life. Husbands, you disciple your wives. Wives, you be part of discipleship with your husband. It's going to look different, men to women and, and husbands to wives, but the Bible tells us how to do this. If you have a non-believer in your household like that, my goodness, that you would be an evangelist in your home. This is the demand of the Bible. This is why it's even a qualification for a pastor or an elder in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5 says this, that he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, 
For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? This is like saying, man, if he doesn't even know how to tie his own shoes, how's he going to organize anything else in his life? This is so obvious and base level. God will hold you, parents, and those who will be parents perhaps someday in the future. God will hold you responsible for what you teach and train your children. You cannot make their hearts believe. That's not your responsibility. But what is, is to teach and to train and to pray over them and to be a part of their discipleship and evangelism all the days of your life. This is plan A for growing the church. I need you guys to hear this. Do you understand that? That's plan A. This is not go into the world and do all these things. Listen, number one, how are we going to reach this world? By making babies and training them to be Christians. This is creation mandate. Subdue the earth. Multiply. This is no joke why we have so many kids. My wife can't keep her hands off me, but like every time that I come back home after watching the crazy news cycle about how nutty the world has gone and watching older age teenagers and 20-somethings flip police cars and burn down homes and attack people on the streets, I go home and say, I'm going to have more babies and I'm going to teach them to never do that junk, but to honor God. That's how we're going to win. We're going to outbreed you. I'm not, I'm not joking. Everybody laughs at that. <laughs> when I first entered into this foray, wondering, okay, Lord, okay, all right. You, you see these passages, right? I'm using very intense language. I get it. I, I, I want you to be pressed on this. All right, we're supposed to take responsibility for this. We're supposed to train and disciple our kids. Okay, okay, okay. What does that mean? Guys, I, I think that my upbringing was a representative one for Christians in my generation. I had great Christian parents, loved me, loved the Lord, taught me to honor the Lord, but we didn't have an intentional time where we open the Bible and daddy taught us. Or when daddy's not there, mommy teaches us. Or, or, or when, when we just sat just to pray. Not, not because it's time to get in bed or because we're having dinner, saying grace before meal, but like just pray. Just check in with the heart and teach true and right things. My, I am so blessed with the upbringing that I had. And by God's grace, I, I want to teach my kids with a greater intentionality than the previous generation, I think, did. For the record, we're the weirdos in history because Christians for centuries took this really seriously up until, up until the last couple hundred years with the invention of children's ministries and public school systems. No, no joke. That's actually what it is. People started thinking, okay, it's not my responsibility to teach my kids faith things or scholarly things. It's somebody else's responsibility. It's my job to make sure they stay alive so they can go off to school or to Sunday school. Okay, that, that shift of thinking happened. And so we're the outsiders in history. People are going to come up to us in heaven and tap on the shoulder. Wait, you're from that generation that didn't train their kids? Like, that's what they're going to say to us. Because we're the weirdos. And when I first realized this, how important this was, entered into this foray and began to research and study what an organized plan, a family discipleship could look like, I became quickly overwhelmed and discouraged. I really did. Because the image that I had formed in my mind was that of a handful of perfect Puritan kids with their ankles crossed and, and their hands on their knees uh, uh, singing hymns in Latin to candlelight. That's the picture. And I don't mock for a moment the image of a highly disciplined and well-organized family worship time. Not at all. But because that was the picture in my mind, I felt that anything short of that immediately was a failure. And I was just, I was lost. Like, well, well if, I, I, if I can't attain that tomorrow... What else? I'm so encouraged by Deuteronomy 6. Two, two chapters later, look at what it says here. And these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Teach diligently and take advantage of all the moments of your life. Just all of them. All of them. Redeem all of those moments. Redeem the car rides to and from church and work and, and the gatherings that you have with family and when you're taking walks and playing at the park and having dinner and debriefing after you watch a movie on the family movie night and all of those things. Take advantage of all of those slots. But you've got to see that after your personal relationship with God, there is no higher priority for you than the discipleship and care for those in your household. Husbands, for your wives and children. Wives, 
for your husband and your children? If you're single right now, you can be a huge help to people. First of all, God may have in mind for you a future family, and you need to have your mind set right now so when you're talking to potential suitors, you make sure that they understand the, the, the severity of not doing this. You find somebody who's like, that's what I want. Go find that. I want you to go home and teach your kids true things about God. That's how we win. This is our plan A. I want to speak for just a moment about Christian education. And here's why I want to do this. Because when I come to a passage like this, the one we covered in Deuteronomy 4 today, we so clearly see the charge laid at our feet to take real responsibility for the training of our children. I think that trying to divide out the sacred from the secular in our child rearing is an awful error scholarly education, and Bible and discipleship. Those are separate, and so are done by two separate groups in two separate ways. I think that's an error, and I think that we will pay dearly for it. I think we have. For the person who thinks, man, I, Rich, I think I know where you're going with this, but I want my children to be a witness to the other kids in their generation. Agreed, agreed. Good impulse, brother and sister. Good impulse, yes. But why do they need government schools to do that? My house is flooded with children all week long. My kids aren't in public schools. You don't have to have the systems the world has given us in order to do the things he's commanded for us to go and do. Yes, let me just say it clearly. I am promoting Christian education. I am promoting homeschooling. I am promoting a Christian schools, some variance between those two ends of the spectrum one way or the other. I am promoting your kids being discipled by Christians all day rather than discipled by non-Christians. That's what I'm promoting. And when I get to passages like this, I can't not press on my brothers and sisters here. And I'm well aware this will probably be the most contentious thing that I say today. I cannot, for the life of me, understand how a Christian can read through verses like this and then conclude, let's send our most innocent, malleable, and impressionable minds into the hands of the world for discipleship for a thousand hours a year during their most formative period of life. I've lost track of the number of times that I've heard Christians say that their motivation for doing that is missional, missional, okay, like we talked about. For the record, that's a wonderful motivation. Train your kids to be missional. After all, shouldn't we send them to, the missionary, to be missionaries in the world? Yes, after they're trained. This is why we don't send our young soldier recruits to Russia for basic training. Because at best, they will train them to be weak and ineffective in battle, and at worst, they will convert them to their side. They will be trained to hate their own homeland. Guys, the stats bear this out a hundred times. What are the numbers these days? Like 80% of Christian kids who grew up in a church go off to college and by the end of their freshman year, hate God? This is absurd. I love your children. I love your families. I want the greatest possible joy for you. The two things that I've been hammered on for preaching on mostly in my entire ministry life is Calvinism. People don't like that. And when I talk about homeschooling, people really don't like that. But I love you. And I admit that I'm nervous sometimes doing this because when I challenge modern Christians on this, few things will trigger you more than when you're confronted on parenting. Because if you didn't know, that's a competitive sport. But it's never been clearer, has it, than 2020 that government schools are not on your side. I understand that there are so many complicated reasons why you may not be in the place to do this with your family. L listen to this too. So I abstain from harsh judgment on you while at the same time challenging you to consider what I'm saying. I'd like this to be the norm for Christians in Utah, not the exception. The same way that I might challenge you to read the Bible every day and yet not hold harsh judgment when you don't. I'm gonna press this into you here. We must prioritize the discipleship of those in our homes. If you don't have kids, you are to invest your home energy into your spouse if you're married. If you're not yet married or not yet have kids and that's something looking forward in the future, have this in mind. Seek out seriously somebody who will do this with you. Maybe become an adopted part of a family in the area. Another Christian family where you can pour into their kids and, and learn from them and be an enormous help to them in a way that maybe they never could by themselves. Be a good example for the children there in your life. But regarding parents, daddies, fathers, you are primarily responsible for the training of your children. God will hold you accountable for this. 
more than anyone else. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All my ministry life, I've sat down with Christian men who felt a burning in their hearts. They, they say, I know there's something. God's stirring up something in my heart. I'm supposed to do something for the Lord. I'm supposed to do something for ministry. Do something to change this world. Do something big. Then pastor your household. Disciple your wife and your children. That's what you do with that energy. Commit yourself to that. Because if nothing else, that will be the training ground that you'll be utilizing in order to launch you into whatever is next. You wouldn't even be qualified for a pastoral role if you weren't already doing that. You, you get that? Men, this is big. In order for you to maximize the effectiveness of the education and the discipleship of your children in your home, it is imperative that you establish a disciplined household. Men, that's primarily on you. If you have not demanded that your children honor their mother with a zero tolerance policy for disrespect, then you will have set them up to lose. You'll come home every day to an exhausted wife and exasperated children and the house in a wreck. There's no wonder why if a husband is not holding the line on this, his wife is not feeling super excited about homeschooling. You've got to hold the line for them. Love them. The Bible makes no provision for passive dads. None. You need to be challenged on that, brothers, mothers, my sisters in faith. I believe that you are the most direct and immediate target of the lies of the world regarding this stuff. The world seeks to undermine the role of mothering, managing the home, and training children. These are among the most wicked and damaging lies out there. Do not believe these lies. Don't believe them. Not one bit of them. You know, I've yet to meet a Christian family in, in my lifetime that I have any memory of where the wife is aching to homeschool, but the Christian dad is resistant. But dozens of times... I've had men who say, I'd love for her to want to do that, but she, she, she just won't. Why? Maybe, husbands, fathers, because you're not establishing a disciplined household to set her up to win. But also women, perhaps, because you've believed the lies of the world. You've been told that you're not qualified to teach your children. What? What? You are the most qualified and suited woman in the history of the world to teach your children. No one has ever been or ever will be more suited to train your children than you. No one. Do not believe that. You've been told that there are other things in your day that deserve more attention than this. But the word of God would say that apart from your personal relationship with God, there's nothing more important than that. Nothing more important to devote your life to than preparing the next generation for victory in the world. Brothers and sisters, we must regain this value as a high priority for us. There is no path toward a flourishing Christian community in Utah that does not include Christians wrestling back control of the day-in, day-out discipling of our children rather than sending them out to the world. There is no other path. Whatever the path is, it must include us taking control of that, us rescuing that back from the world's grasp. Brothers and sisters, these are the things I think that we ought to be known for a high view of God, a bold approach to evangelism, a tenacious resolve to please God rather than men, an uncompromising commitment to God's word, a conviction that doctrine matters, a ferocious love for others, and a prioritizing of the home. Let's pray. Father, this very morning, I ask that you would help impress upon our hearts in whatever area of these seven listed here, we need the most change. Lord, it's uncomfortable for us to be challenged. It's uncomfortable for us to hear these things and to see them and, and to know that our lives are not always lined up as they ought to be. Please help us to do what you've commanded for us. Help us to not look like the world in these things, but to do what you've made clear in your word for us to do. Lord, help us to be loving and helpful and gracious and gentle with those around us because we're all trying to pursue these things, Lord, in a variety of different ways. 
Help us to be so eager to be compassionate, first with one another, and then even with those outside of our church body, Lord. But Father, help us to still pursue these things so that it would be true when a person were to say one of these regarding our church. Help us, Lord, we ask. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.